why did you write a book on the supernatural? Right. Well, look, I, I think, the, you know, the idea of the supernatural and the distinction between the natural and the supernatural is, is kind of fundamental to, you know, a range of things that we think are important in the present. So, for example, we typically understand religion as, you know, having some kind of commitment to belief in the supernatural or, you know, something beyond the present. So the idea of the supernatural is central to how we understand religion. But on the other side, it's also, I think, a crucial part of what we might call modern naturalism. And, and naturalism is understood in different ways, but we can understand it in this very simple sense that naturalism wants to say, well, we deny the existence of the supernatural. And indeed, most of our approaches in in the academic sphere are, are now naturalistic, which is to say that we explicitly exclude reference to the supernatural when we're giving a, accounts of things. So this distinction between the natural and the supernatural and is, is, is central to aspects of, you know, kind of modern understandings, both in how we conceptualise religion and also in this, this approach to understanding the world where we say, look, we're going to adopt a naturalistic approach and that means exclusion of the supernatural. So all of, you know, all of this understanding then hinges on this crucial distinction between the natural and the supernatural. Now, what I was interested to discover is that this distinction is relatively recent and distinctively Western. So the question then is, you know, how did people in the past conceptualise, you know, their religious understandings if they didn't have this modern distinction between the natural and the supernatural? And what sense can we make of naturalism as an approach if, you know, this distinction is relatively recent and distinctively Western? So that, that was the kind of, you know, motivation be, behind uh, a book that focuses on this distinction and its history. It's interesting that yeah modern science in naturalism and okay we have to kind of take a stance on what kind of thinking about the world and we go okay so, i mean we can't focus on everything the science has certain tools and ways of going about studying what it studies uh, but then it kind of needs to use a, a distinction like what we you know the cutoff the supernatural like you know there's something which we can't study there's something kind of beyond what we would explain maybe by natural laws i mean is that that's something you were exploring out of what what do we then mean by the supernatural and what, what exactly is it yeah so look i mean so part of the part of the, the thrust of the book was you know I, I think it's it's often assumed that you know the sciences are incredibly successful in delivering you know particular understandings and technologies and i think one of the assumptions is that that success um, derives from this naturalistic approach and so that the idea of a, separating out the natural and the supernatural and focusing on the natural is a way to make progress. But again, I think what's interesting that, that you know, so key scientific figures in the past um, did not observe this distinction. So it's fairly clear that you, you can have versions of successful science that don't require this natural supernatural distinction and part of what the, the book attempts to give an account of is the fact that although naturalism as its, its contemporary advocates explicitly disavow commitment to the supernatural in fact a lot of the theistic assumptions that that attended um, the modern science when it was getting underway still flow through into these contemporary naturalistic understandings. So in, in other words, another way of putting it is to say that although contemporary naturalists explicitly deny the existence of the supernatural and disavow, in fact, many of the, the features of science, in, including p particular understandings of the uniformity of, and intelligibility of nature, actually had their origins in what we might call supernaturalistic understandings of the world, and that these have carried through even though, you know, naturalists will explicitly disavow that there's any kind of theological assumptions built into their naturalistic understandings. Mm, interesting. I mean, let me let me see if I can understand that and if you can expand on that. So there's a way in which when one goes about studying the world, the, nat the, the world in a naturalist, the, the natural world, and you make these distinctions, what we can and can't study, um, 
I mean, would you say that science makes certain presuppositions about what kind of thing the world is? And so, you know, the fact that scientific knowledge even makes sense, that it can work, that we can do the enterprise of science, does this rely on things beyond the natural? What, what? Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's exactly it, I think. You, you, mm. You've expressed mm. it really well. Um, and I think one of the, which is to say, you know, why is the universe intelligible at all? Which is not a question that science can answer. It's a question that science assumes from the outset. And I think, look, the, the, the clearest example of how this works, I think, is to look at our conception of laws of nature. And, and what naturalists will typically do in, in arguing for naturalism is say, look, all we need to explain what's going on in the world are the laws of nature. We don't actually need you know, supernatural, spooky stuff. But if you look at the origins of the conception of laws of nature, and, and laws of nature as a way of understanding the world first emerged as a concept in the 17th century. The philosopher Descartes was really important, but obviously, you know, and Descartes has, the, you know, the first law of motion, which then Newton adopts. Uh, and Newton famously has these, you know, these laws of motion that give an account of how the world operates. But for the original authors of this conception of laws of nature, the laws of nature were divine edicts. So Descartes says quite explicitly, you know, that a law of nature is God, you know, directing the particles of nature to behave in particular rational, logical ways. And so the laws of nature for Descartes, they derive their universality uh, and their immutability from their divine source. So for Descartes, and indeed for the, for, the, for the scientists who take up this conception, and most famously Newton, um, the very concept of a law of nature is deeply theological. And so, so and well, now what happens to this theological conception of laws of nature is in the 19th century, people kind of forget its theological origins. And they say, well, we've just got these laws of nature and they explain everything. But the explanation of the laws of nature themselves was originally theological. Then the question then is, and, and I think this is to some extent an open question, is whether the laws of nature make any sense without the original theological foundation that, that certainly initially gave them coherence. So that's the, the kind of paradox of contemporary naturalism is that although it explicitly disavows you know, the supernatural and God and all of that, stuff originally as a new idea of how we understand the intelligibility of the world it was thoroughly theological mm. so almost wh wh where do these laws kind of come from or, or, or you know what, what what allows there to be these laws such that like from one time to the next it seems like we can see these coherent patterns that don't seem to change right and the, and, and is it related do you feel to the kind of a fine tuning sort of argument for, for, for God even of almost, okay, you have, you can, the laws explain things, but where do those come from? For example, people thinking about to what degree could the, the laws of physics be different? And then would that have allowed life or even the world, the universe as we know it to exist? Yeah, so, so I think there is, there is an interesting connection there. So, I, you know, I have mixed feelings about fine tuning arguments. Um, because I, I think they assume that they tend to assume that the current the current standard model in physics is actually the right one, and you know I think one way of thinking about the, the implications of fine tuning to say is well actually maybe that maybe there are problems with the standing the standard model, and so to remind your listeners so, so the fine tuning argument is essentially that you know had the various constants and laws that we we currently observed in the universe, had they been slightly different, you know, had the strong and weak nuclear forces been slightly different, a stable universe would have been impossible. And so it does appear that the universe, it, you know, as Fred Hoyle says, it looks like a put up job. Fred Hoyle, an atheist um, cosmologist, he said, it's, it's, it's really interesting. If you look at the constants in the laws of nature, if they were slightly different, we wouldn't have had the universe we've had. Now, what follows from that? And some people have argued, well, this, this actually leads you to theistic, um, you know, to some, some notion of theistic design. Now, I'm, I'm not sure about that, but, but what I would say is that it's interesting that the universe on this model has these particular features and particularly these, these kinds of laws. 
Um, and if we forget for the moment about the content of those laws, the fact that there are these laws and the universe is intelligible to us does seem to me something that require it, it, you can either say well this is just a brute thing that we have to accept or you can you can say well we need to try and give some account of of, of how that works um, now I, I think the other thing you might say about laws of nature and this is again this is a discussion that goes back to the 17th century um, where Newton Newton says or the, the, certainly the um, in the second edition of his famous work, the Principia, um, the the introduction goes something like this: You know, God could have instantiated any number of systems to make the world the way it is, um, because he can will you know a number of different uh, arrangements. So what we need to do, we can't simply speculate. We've got to go out there and investigate what order what rules and laws and constants god has actually chosen to instantiate in the world uh, and again newton says explicitly rather than those he might have done you know because he had a range of options so the idea that these thinkers are working with from descartes to newton is that and we see this famously in leibniz who says that god must have created the best of all possible worlds you know again god has a range of options why does he choose to this particular order of nature. Well, Leibniz argues it's because it was the best one, right? And he could have chosen other ones, but this was the best one. Now, this was famously lampooned and it was a controversial hypothesis. But the general point is that for all of these thinkers, when God creates the world, he has a range of options and he chooses one. And for Newton, what follows is because we can't intuit God's logic for creating a particular world, and this is where he differs from Leibniz, um, we need to actually investigate, you know, what are the laws, the constants, and so on that we find in the world. Um, and so that then becomes a motivation. It, so law, the conception of laws of nature not merely is a way of understanding how the world is intelligible, but it also, for Newton, motivates an empirical inquiry into discovering exactly uh, the, the the specific nature of those laws. Mm. When in our modern times, w when researchers and scientists think about then a, a world that's purely naturalistic, where we have laws, but the there's no explanation, like say Newton, as you say, seems to be saying, where actually you know you would never have thought that we need to like get rid of God in these explanations. No, but it's, it's, but we want to understand the laws nevertheless, but then it seems like then the laws and the, them kind of supplant um, that kind of theological fate, which, which in the past were, were there in the past. So then, you know, what is the impact? Like, what does that, does it, does it matter for our modern science and modern conception of the world that we can, you know, and that we have, that we could just have naturalistic explanations. I mean, is that, is that does that cause problems? What what does that do if we kind of take that new stance? Yeah, sure. So so look, does it cause problems for science? Well, no, it not it, not in terms of its day to day operations. No, I don't think it does, um, because you can. It's just a, um, you can perfectly well do science without you know any deep understanding of the metaphysics that might it might presuppose or that lies beneath it and i think this interestingly i think in physics this has been a trend that we've seen since since you know the beginning of the 20th century when um when we get the new physics it's clear that the key actors in bringing about the new physics and quantum mechanics and, and relativity um these guys are very philosophically sophisticated and they're aware of the philosophical implications of what they're doing but since that time, we've had, and this is partly owing, I think, to the high degree of specialisation in physics and the breakdown in cross-disciplinary discussions. You know, the standard thing has often been to shut up and calculate is the, you know, is the shorthand for certainly in quantum mechanics, which is, in, in other words, just forget about, forget about the deep philosophical issues, which are quite 
intriguing, I think, in quantum mechanics. So just get on with the calculations because what we have here is a model that gives us terrific predictability, right? So I think, and and that's all you need. That's, that I think is, and that, that is a broad, we'd say an empiricist approach that says, well, let, let's just forget about the underlying, the deep underlying, you know, philosophical implications and metaphysical implications. Let's just get on with the stuff because we can see this is working. And I think because that's been kind of prevailing attitude, these broader questions about, well, why do we think nature is intelligible at all? Or, you know, the, the sorts of questions that le- then lead to the, the fine tuning arguments and so on. These tend to be a little bit beyond the purview of, of, say, physics as it's typically practiced, because you can do the stuff without having to worry too much about, you know, these broader questions about the metaphysical origins that make science possible at all so for practical purposes i think you can bracket out these questions but but i think if you're after an overarching satisfactory account of what makes science possible that's not something science internally can provide from within within its own purview you need to have a broader perspective and i think Mm. that's essentially what you know, you know, and I think a number of a number of scientists, to their credit, are interested in those broader questions, but but they're they're difficult to manage. And for the most part, for the practicing scientists, it's sufficient just to get on with the job. It's interesting that the question of what kind of thing, what kind of uh, substance, or is is behind uh, reality, um, you know, because it's almost like physics can. Its, its job is to, as you say, kind of predict things, and and though it talking to other philosophers, it doesn't necessarily though need to really say anything about what anything is. It's not like it really. It's it's like talking about maybe the properties and the laws of motions of things, but uh, the the metaphysics and these are kind of higher level questions, which as you say, for the most part, we can kind of put to the side. It's uh, it's interesting. I'm going to be talking to a, a philosopher who is thinking about relational metaphysics and kind of uh, maybe there isn't really a, even a substance at the bottom of reality, but kind of there, there it's, 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 it's yeah, purely relational. And so a kind of against uh, materialism, which it's interesting then and, and as well, because it's almost like sometimes when science says, well, we can ignore these kind of high level even theological philosophical questions. Um, it sometimes often takes a, materialistic it takes almost metaphysical stances without without really acknowledging them sometimes it makes me think so it's like you you kind of take a stance anyway like if you yeah you're kind of nodding but it's like if you if you say okay we're gonna you know think fundamental particle physics this is the this is the science you know even other sciences are really you know not as important as this one but that kind of assumes that these small things are the most important thing to study and and that kind of that in itself is an assumption yeah so i think you know it, it to some extent you, you get you get a you get a, a range of attitudes. So, so you know, one is well, we just shut up and calculate. We get on with the job. You know, some people do think about the broader metaphysical assumptions and presuppositions. But the other one, I think, and this is the one that's problematic, is the assumption that that science is really the only way that we can account for reality, and there is no other method. There is no other approach. Um, and, and what that really means is that these are these other questions are pseudo questions, are questions of what makes why is the world intelligible, um, what makes science work at all, because these aren't scientific questions. You know, one argument is well, and science can't answer them; they're intrinsically unanswerable because science is really the only way that we can address these questions. And, and that's that's the position that I think problematically shades into scientism. That argues, well, look, you know, philosophy, metaphysics, theology, you know, even the humanity, more broadly speaking, you know, these are just, you know, these are just hobbies, you know, and if you want to indulge yourself in that, sure, but really, science is the only way that we can we can adequately address these broader questions about what's real, and as you say, that tends to lead to a kind of reductive. I don't know materialism, perhaps, but you know what? If if modern physics tells us anything, it tells us that materialism is a deeply problematic aspect 
And your question about, you know, your, your point about relations being important is, is one response to that sort of reductive materialism. Um, so, so, yeah, so right. just to go back to the point, you know, sure, science does require something beyond science to give an account of it, although some people argue it doesn't. And that's really the position of scientism that says, well, science is all you need to explain everything. I mean, do you think that... We kind of, I mean, we're arguing that, that that I guess that science can't do that. But I mean, would you be able to strongman the case of why you think that science can? Is there a way in which one can formulate science such that it can explain everything? Because I, mean, I want to probe then deeper into what I mean. What, especially in our modern, yeah, I mean, either people don't think about it or they think. I mean, I mean, why? Why you know? Because I think people often say, well, maybe we could eventually. Why do you need to presuppose a god from the beginning? Can you not kind of? eventually we'll find things out you know i mean science is a uh, necessarily incomplete so so because of that you know, you know is there a way in which it could eventually do things well you know sure you, you, you know i mean what you see this argument very commonly in relation to say human consciousness and the argument is well look you know eventually um you know neuroscience will actually give give us an adequate account of consciousness you know so that that's that's certainly an argument you see um I, I would say that, you know, my sense of it looking at as an outsider is that, you know, the more we know about the facts of neuroscience, the more puzzling the, the problem of consciousness becomes. So that's a kind of specific example of why I think that some of these questions require philosophical, metaphysical, and perhaps even, you know, religious dimensions in order to give a full account of them. Um, you know, what... So that I think scientism, the idea that science can explain everything, is really an extrapolation from the success of science, and which I think is, you know, undoubted, but it's an extrapolation from that to say, well, you know, science therefore can explain everything. But, but logically, to go back to a previous point, you know, what science can't internally give an account of is what makes science possible at all. And that does seem to require something else. Unless you say, well, this is, you know, if there's just brute facts about the world that we have to understand without explaining, which is to say its intelligibility, its rationality, its mathematical transparency. These are things that science assumes. And because it assumes them, it can't explain them. Um, And so your, your, your options are either you think that these things have an additional explanation or you just put them into the camp where they say well i'm just not going to try to give an account of these things and and that seems to me to be uh you know just putting an arbitrary limit on the kinds of things that we can attempt to explain and understand Mm. i mean on that note would you say that it's interesting because i kind of wanted to ask i mean then is religion and and uh, uh, relief in God one stance by which you can go beyond science and and kind of pick up those those really important questions that presuppose science that that help answer them? But it's like it's not. Like, I mean, religion, relief in God came before science, so it's a bit of a a strange a strange way to pose that question, right? Because I mean, we're we're going from the stance of and there's there's perhaps a perspective in one culture where where there's science and then. You know, do we need something more than that? Whereas, I guess this is, seems like a, it's just. I mean, just wanting to almost understand, contextualize, and savor the fact that this is this this modern stance that science um, is the be all and end all is kind of very new and something that's yeah yeah yeah. So, so a couple of things on this point. You know, I think certainly science is new and distinctive, and and there are good clearly there are good things good things about that. Um, but but I think underpinning underpinning this scientistic attitude that science is all we need is a kind of there's a and i talk about this a little little bit in the book there's there's a there's really an assumed history of progress and that history of progress often takes that it it often you know has the plot line that what we see in cultural advance is a move away from religion which represents a kind of primitive form of science and a kind of deficient form of explanation and understanding to, you know, a a truly a scientific understanding, which actually gives us a genuinely rational and justifiable 
evidence-based understanding of the world. And so, so part of the assumption of you know the all uh, the all-encompassing explanatory capacity of science, part of what will often inform that is a history is a view of history that sees societies and preeminently the European West as being in the forefront of civilizational advance by virtue of its adoption of science, which is to be understood as a move away from competing and primitive, in a way, re- explanations of what's going on in the world. So I think that, that often tacitly or otherwise in, informs how we think about science in relation to these other things. Now, the actual, if we look at the actual history, so these progress stories were kind of invented in the 17th century. They're typically, although there are a range of views in the Enlightenment, one of the predominant views that emerges from the Enlightenment is this idea of civilizational progress, understood in terms of a move away from religious understandings to scientific ones. And the, the assumption here is that they're kind of incompatible, they're competing for the same explanatory territory, and that there's a kind of inevitability to the triumph of scientific explanations over religious ones. But if we actually look at the, 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 the relevant history, what we see is that the success of modern science in the 17th century actually depends on these, these religious presuppositions, explicitly theological presuppositions about laws of nature, but it also draws on, on religion for its social and moral legitimation so to speak so just to just to give you a contrast case you know we do see science we do see science emerging in different places and in different times we see science in ancient greece in medieval islam we see it in china but what we don't see in these cultural contexts is science consolidating and becoming really a central feature of of the knowledge making enterprises of these cultures and the reason is that in these cultures, there are other things that are valued either equivalent to science or above science. So in China, for example, there was a focus on the study of the classics, and we might broadly speaking, we'd say humanities. So what's distinctive about the West um, is not merely that science emerges in the 17th century, but it receives social legitimation and becomes a central part of the culture in a way that doesn't happen in these other scientific cultures. So part of what we have to explain is why does that happen uniquely in the West and not in these other places? And my argument would be, and I'm not the only person to argue this, that my argument would be it's the capacity of science to draw upon the legitimating power of religion that actually establishes it as this this dominant way of understanding the world. So that's a contrasting... So as I say, you've got two understandings of, of, of how we get to science where it is one which is the scientific view that sees science as the vanguard of progress moving away from religion, where religion is the thing that science helps us overcome. What I think is a more accurate historical picture is that actually science is grounded in a set of religious assumptions about the intelligibility of nature and the specific form of that intelligibility and laws of nature, and that eventually in the 19th century, science kind of forgets about its metaphysical foundations and just gets on with the business of doing science and brackets out those questions. When you And when you say that, it makes me reflect on how, as a scientist, one, there's so many questions one could try to answer. And, 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 the, and, and so it, it kind of is an open question then, what, what kind of scientific questions do we as a, a civilization decide that this, these are ones that are important and not and even that question of what is important and what is not what is is like what is kind of comes practical like what where do you put resources what questions do you want to answer and like because there's like an infinite number of hypotheses you could test that that also makes me think as you say there it actually matters in a deep practical way what metaphysical considerations you have for the the why behind and what that science you do contributes to sure yeah so look I, so here's here's the thing I, I think the success of science is actually premised on a focus on small questions right is the key thing so that so that you have lots and lots of people working on 
very, very small aspects of, of a problem and that the aggregate of working on these is actually what makes some kind of progress eventually possible. So that's a very different kind of approach to thinking globally about, well, you know, the question, well, what should science actually be delivering to us? And that question is a normative question, which is to say it's a question about values and science is not terribly good at dealing with values. The, 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 the values questions actually come are the sorts of questions that we deal with in the humanities, right, in you know, philosophy, religion, literature. And so that, you know, if you ask, you know, what are, the, what are the, the sort of fundamental existential questions for the present? Well, you know, obviously um, the, the environmental crisis and global warming is a major problem. Science can make a significant contribution to that. But the question, the, the question that lies behind why we're in this environmental crisis to start with is not a scientific question at all. It's a question about, you know, the particular values that we have, the attitudes to nature that we have, and science is related to these, but science, in other words, the answer to these questions about sort of climate crisis are not a questions that science can contribute to with technological solutions potentially, but at its heart, it's a question about values. It's not a question about technologies. Mm. It's, you know, um, to go back to, to the start when I talked to, I asked about the supernatural, it's interesting because we kind of bring in things like values and the intelligibility of the world, for example, that how can scientific knowledge be distributed across people? Because uh, that's interesting. You Even in your book, I remember reading about how, I mean, knowledge is that we can even say this knowledge can be shared across people. And right? it's not like an experiential knowledge. It's almost a different kind of knowledge that such that it can be shared uh, across people. Um, and... Uh, the, so, but with, you know, the reason I, I come back to that is when I, some, I think sometimes I think about the supernatural and I think about, uh, I don't know, I, I almost want to think about what there must be, and what other kinds of things can science not study? Because I guess, uh, you know, it's interesting. I think about different, you know, people talk about aliens in different dimensions or these kinds of things. These are like science can't get at it kind of in a way. But that's kind of almost a more practical thing where we, you know, how would one do empirical tests of these kinds of things, right? Versus these more theological, philosophical questions of uh, the nature of reality. Um, what, what is the, the something? What, what, what can, do you think science? What it makes me think, kind of ask. Well, yeah, what kind of thing is science? Uh, yeah. then you know if yeah yeah well, i mean just just to advert to i mean to go back to the point about you know science focusing on small scientists focusing on small questions and you know you made reference to the fact that um you know scientific knowledge is distributed broadly so i think here we can actually draw parallels between what happens in religious communities for example what happens in scientific communities so you know one of the, the standard distinctions between science and religion is well you know religion's based on faith and science is based on reason and, and evidence um, and that that you know if you think about the, the motto of the royal society for example it's nullius in verba which means you know the the original latin is something like don't take anyone's word for it or if you if you go to the royal society's website that's probably the kind of translation that that you see, which and the idea is, well, you test this for yourself, and this is in science, you test things for yourself and you establish on the basis of evidence that such and such is the case. And the contrast case is in religion, where you seem to be taking people's word for it. Now, although that's the rhetoric of science, in fact, science deeply depends on people taking other people's word for it because it's a communal activity, trust is actually a core part of what makes science work, and so trusting other people's claims in the sciences is, is, is really key. Um, and so trust plays a role both in religious communities and scientific communities. And here the general point is that, that, that in science you really need, you know, these, these trust relationships to make the whole enterprise work. And although it's, it's, it's often invisible to the general public, the notion that science, you know, scientists are out there establishing for themselves 
certain facts about the natural world is simply false. They have to rely on others. And so you've got this notion in the religious context that's called implicit faith, which is to say you trust in the deliverances of other scientists. And this is why I think in some of the medical research and, and social scientific research, we now have this crisis, this, this replication crisis, where it seems that experiments and tests can't be repeated. We don't get, they can be repeated, but we don't get the same results when we repeat certain things. And this is leading to a breakdown of trust. Um, and it's, a, it's partly a function of, um, you know, dodgy statistics, partly a function of the perverse incentives in the sciences that, that we don't publish um, null results. You know, we only publish things that seem to confirm a hypothesis. Um, and that, that has the, so the, the economics, as it were, in the broad picture of how science operates um, tend to m mitigate, militate against, um, you know, arriving at the right conclusion. Anyway, long, cutting a long story short, you know, you're asking about well, what kind of activity is science? It's not people individually testing for themselves things. It's a communal activity. And as this communal activity that relies on scientific consensus, it also deeply requires that, that there are structures of trust built into the operation. And in this respect, insofar as that science relies on this notion of trust, it's not that far away from religious communities' reliance on authorities and faith. Yes, I, I really like that you bring in this dimension of faith, trust, belief. It's... it's, it's um something which as I found really kind of insightful from your from your work is that we kind of often even the way sort of Christian religious developments progressed that f like faith kind of became degraded or such that it kind of meant only belief something which you can kind of and it's interesting you say there the kind of the the royal society and like what we mean by reason is something which can kind of you don't need anything else to accept it it's almost like like when you read a mathematical proof it's like it, it just makes sense to you, you know, and, and the, the reason is really good in that sense. Uh, and, but it's interesting, though, that with science, people, other people doing experiments and you don't have access to what they're doing and we have to share things. And, and then, as you say, and I've had conversations about replication crises in science, and uh, it's, it's, it's like you can, you know, we want to kind of think that, well, you know, a scientist is going to automatically care about getting the truth and the right things but you know it's it's and it's it's obviously a, 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 a dimension one has to kind of consider that inevitably there are going to be other considerations right um because science is embedded in us as humans and and in the social world and, and so of course these incentives sort of impinge on us yeah yeah so look i, I mean i don't want to impugn the, the the motivations of scientists who are I, I think for the most part are you know generally <laughs> You know, you know, well intentioned. They're really interested in establishing the truth. But the fact is that we live in a, you know, as you say, we, we kind of live in a world where, um, if you if you look at how science f functions as a kind of social reality, um, there are perverse incentives built into the system. You know, the publish or perish syndrome that we we all suffer from in the academic world. You know, this this is really unfortunate because it, it as I say. It, 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 what people are after is a public, you know, a, a publishable outcome, and that's not always compatible with some, um, you know, some impartial quest for, for truth. And the fact is that once you get embedded into a particular culture of scientific research, you know, you, you just become habituated to the forms that that this this activity takes. Uh, and and uh, the reality is often different from the very idealised conception of science that's often presented to us as a kind of this dispassionate quest for truth. Um, and you know, once you once you sort of lift the lid and, and look under the bonnet, you, you you find that this is a very human activity, which is you know, in a sense precisely what we'd expect. Mm. What do you think is the future of your work and the future of kind of but particularly actually I'm interested in almost even before that what do you think the future of science and religion and and, and whether science will have to or is this 
culture, we have to kind of realize uh, and, and bring in the fact that values are something that science itself cannot decide and that they might become a more central issue that, that can't, kind of can't be ignored? Yeah, so it's a good question. So, look, you know, what, what do I expect from my work? I, I think, you know, one, you know, at the, at the very basic level, I think what I'd say is that the success of science tells us nothing about whether naturalism is true, right? It, it's, it's, that's, that's simply a false assumption, that's, which is to say that the fact that we can do science actually it, it sort of some way counts against religion, that just seems to me completely false. It's false philosophically, but certainly it's false historically because we have, you know, historical examples of individuals who are very conscious of the theological foundations of their scientific enterprise. And these people are, are really, you know, people like Isaac Newton who are key figures in the establishing of modern science. So I think one thing I would hope to do through my work is to decouple this assumption or decouple the connection between science and a thoroughgoing naturalism that denies the supernatural. I think we're, it's, it's common to think that they go together. They don't, right? So that, that's, that's for the start. You know, as for, as for the future of science, you know, you know, science is kind of fine in one sense as it, as it is. It's, it's not fine when it presumes to make larger metaphysical pronouncements or to go back to things we've discussed. It assumes that science is the only way to explain things. And I think people... You know, my sense is that people are increasingly understanding that science, Im impressive and important though it is, has its limits, um, and that the broad existential questions that face us now um, are not ones that science alone can tackle, and that we need the resources of, you know, philosophy and religion, um, and and the things that other cultures can actually teach us. To be honest, where we have relationships with the natural world that are different from what's emerged in the West, but nonetheless can be salutary for us in understanding, hey, there are other ways of thinking about the natural world that are not exploitative, that wouldn't have landed us in the current mess that we're in, um, and that if we can think outside the box, right, both in terms of our own historical past, and there are resources there, and what we see in other cultures, you know, we can, we can tap into resources that will help us with the problems that we currently face that to some extent are associated with a narrow technological reductionistic approach to the world that was the thing that made science uh, successful in the first place. Do you have any last words or any, any way you want to point people to see your work? This has been really fun. No, but I'd mean, I, I just say that the, the, the book we've been talking about, um, it just came out a few months ago. It's called Some New World. And it looks at these very broad questions about conceptions of, of na nature and conceptions of the supernatural um, and, and how this artificial distinction um, in influences how we think about both the operations of science and religion. If you'd like to listen to more podcasts like this, then maybe check out one of these recommended here or subscribe to my channel if you're new. Thank you for listening to this podcast.